work it, make it, do it, make sense. Um, hi, thanks for coming to my talk uh, titled All Machine Learning is Really Complicated and I Can Never Learn It. Um, I actually hope over the course of the next 15 minutes I can convince you otherwise. Um, so to set a bit of context for the talk first, um, uh, my name's Christian. I'm a self-taught software engineer. I've got, actually got a background in mechanical and environmental engineering. Spent a lot of time looking at energy policy. Um, I currently work as a data engineer at a large financial services company, um, building out our data ingestion systems in the cloud. Um, I previously worked as a data scientist in the same company as a more like general software engineer and in the cloud architecture team. Um, I've been very, very lucky to be on a grad program that lets me rotate around really diverse areas. Um, now my journey in the industry has been from a place where I didn't really know what or, or who Jenkins was, uh, or what Tomcat was, or, or what an API really meant. So I've been through a really steep learning curve, and I found that the steepest learning curve was in the data science team, in the machine learning, because um, I found the, very, the start was very, very dense and very inaccessible. So this talk is sort of aimed at addressing that. I'm hoping to, to achieve three things, really. To give an overview of some of the major kinds of problems that machine learning can help solve, um, to show where you might have seen it in, in real life, uh, where you might have encountered it. And lastly, to make the first steps less dense, to try and encourage more people to, to have a stab. So it, it's useful to start by trying to broadly define what machine learning is. It's, it's the thing that lets you move from a world where you say, if the heat exceeds 80 degrees Celsius, then we've got a problem, it's likely to fail, to, to a world where you say, I've got all this data showing the component conditions over time. Some of them failed. Let's use that to define what the pre-fader state is, and we'll act on that. It's the idea of getting machines to provide insights or to drive actions based on what the data says rather than what the code says. Even more simply, it's the idea of writing generalized code that can do specific things. People often ask, um, how does machine learning relate to, relate to AI? For our purposes, it's just a specific subset where AI is generally making computers behave smart. Um, dictionaries and academics will give, give you proper differences, proper definitions, but it's kind of just semantics. So within machine learning, there are three main types. You have supervised learning, which is when you, you are looking for something specific from your data. It's when you have a kind of known outcome or a known thing that you want your data to predict or to point out to you. You have unsupervised learning, which is when you don't have that specific target um, and you're looking more to understand your data. There are many, many different kinds. Um, a really cool example is clustering algorithms, like they use at Spotify, where they look at your playlist, play history, put them into discrete groups based on how similar they are, and then add new songs for you to try. Um, and the last kind is reinforcement learning, which is a situation where you have an agent, and then that agent can carry out actions. And then you reward or punish that agent based on whether the action has led to a success or failure. Um, you might have seen a video on YouTube of a machine slowly learning to play Super Mario Brothers on its own. That's reinforcement learning. Um, we won't actually be looking at unsupervised or reinforcement learning here, because they aren't the nicest place to start. Um, I've actually not touched them too much myself, um, and I haven't got time, it's 15 minutes. Um, so talking about supervised learning, there are broadly two main kinds. Um, you have classification and regression. Classification is, is where you want to split things or predict things into discrete categories, kind of like, what, what fruit is this? Or a much simpler example, binary example, given the full passenger list of the Titanic, can you predict who would have survived and who died? There are many different uh, algorithms you can use to approach these problems. The one I'll start with is a, is a very visually intuitive one. It's a tree model. And the way it works is you start with a simple baseline prediction, where you say, I have knowledge that, unfortunately, 60% of people on board the boat didn't make it off alive. And so for every single passenger, if I predict they didn't survive, if I predict they died, I have instantly a 60% accuracy. But then if I realize that I know that there's a split on gender, maybe 80% of the males didn't, the males died, but only 25% of, of the females died, I can then do a single split where I say, if it's a man, predict dead, if it's a woman, predict survive. I suddenly jumped to a 75% accuracy. Now, if you keep going with that, you end up with something like this, which is a three-branch three tree based on gender, um, age, and number of siblings or spouses that person had on board. Now, this is really clearly something you could write yourself using some if or switch statements or whatever. But the really cool part is that when you use the machine learning algorithm to do this, at each layer, it looks for the optimal split, and it does it for you. You don't have to yourself pick out the fact that being older than 10 years old is a good thing. 
Trees aren't, obviously aren't the only model or the only algorithm you can use here. Um, there are many others, things like support vector machines, and you've probably heard of neural networks. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to go into them, again, this is a 15-minute talk, but they are more used than these, and they're definitely worth reading into more if, if this sort of catches your interest. So the other kind of machine, a supervised learning problem that I mentioned was a regression problem, and that's when you're interested in a, in a continuous outcome rather than a discrete outcome. Um, at a high level, most regression algorithms are just simply doing a line of best fit search. So this is an example of a univariate linear regression where you're looking at a single input, someone's high school GPA, and trying to predict their university GPA off that. More commonly, you'll find people don't use univariate, they use multivariate, which is the, the same idea, just with many, many more inputs, and it's very hard to visualize. So I've gone for the univariate one here. Um, the other thing that might be really obvious here is that this strongly relies on a strict linear rela relationship between your input and your output. But again, that can be handled by allowing your variables to multiply by each other, or to take the square root of them, or square them or something. But you fundamentally come back to the same idea of, I just want to find a line of best fit in many dimensions. Um, that's what the equation looks like, where you have an output. It's, it's literally a mass equation. So where might you have encountered some of these machine learning um, problems in the real world? So Facebook uh, and Apple iPhoto and Google Photos, they famously automatically detect faces um, in photos. The way they do that is when you upload a photo, uh, they put a scanning box on it, and they move that box across. And at each point, they have a classification problem, which is inside this box, is there a face? If they do find a face there, they've got a second problem. Given I have a face, can I predict whose face it is? This is quite a cool new problem. But something that I think is, is cooler, which is, is debatable, is the idea of email spam filters. Because they're a, they're not a new, it's, not a, it's not a new problem. Um, and this is a situation where you've gone from the old world of humanely trying to predict these things by saying, does the email have the words buy cheap or discount or Viagra or something, to a world now where you have stacks of known spam emails, stacks of known good non-spam emails, and you throw it into a model. And the model itself, without human uh, intervention, will pick out the predictors of spam. So you no longer need to yourself be chasing uh, the habits of spammers. Regression is used very widely as well. Um, an example I mentioned here is, is in sales forecasting, um, especially in real estate management. So hotels and other places can and do build models that will take into account things like what the weather is or expected weather is, and what time of year it is, what the macroeconomic effects are. If you're in the recession or in growth, uh, you might have different numbers of customers willing to come to you. Um, the flight prices into the country concerned, and things like is the website being heavily hit right now and how full am I, to predict uh, what the optimal room rate is that they should charge to maximize their profit. So, as I mentioned at the start, my, my ideal hope from this really short 15-minute talk is that people go away and, and have, a, have a stab at doing something. So I thought I'd also quickly have a look at what things you should think about when approaching a problem. The first thing to think about is this idea of feature engineering, because data doesn't always, and actually usually doesn't, come in a very easy-to-consume format. So feature engineering is the process of creating features or variables within your data that you can reasonably expect to help you in your, in your uh, attempts to predict something. So if I go back to the Titanic example, uh, you're given like, full names, ages, ticket prices, and more in the data set. I've given a truncated version here. Um, you might have a theory, though, that someone's class, someone's social class, might influence their chance of getting off alive. Maybe if you're a baron or a, or a madame or a... Or a, or a dame or something, you could you elbow your way to the front of the lifeboat or, so, or something. But you can't really extract that from this data as it stands. But you might recognize that someone's title strongly influences, or strongly indicates, sorry, their class. So you could do some feature engineering, where you extract everything from the first column to the first full stop and put it into its own uh, variable. Suddenly, you've made someone's class available to your model to consume. And you actually find it's quite predictive. Uh, a slightly more complicated real-world example is if you, if I, if you mentioned, if remember I mentioned um, Spotify do clustering on your, on your uh, listening habits. They actually do that based on features they engineer themselves, on things like danceability of a song and acousticness of a song, and they build those before putting it through the clustering algorithm by looking at some of the underlying metrics of the song. The other thing to think about is that in nearly every case, um, the data you have, you have available in front of you to build a model is only a small subset of the data that really exists in the real world. And again, most of the time, you don't really care about your accuracy on this small subset. You really care about your accuracy across all data out there in the real world. Does it generalize? And if it doesn't generalize, you've overfitted. 
A really extreme example is, again, if I go back to the Titanic example, this is a, quite a shallow tree with only three splits. But you could imagine it kept going until every single leaf, every single node had a single person in it. So someone was male, age 22, uh, uh, had three siblings on board, the ticket cost more than 30 pounds, had no children, blah, 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 called Joseph. You couldn't reasonably expect that to scale to, to the general real world. So that's definitely an overfitted model. The way you avoid this is by splitting the data you have available in front of you into a train and a test set. And what you do is you, you build your model on that train set, and then you move it across point at your test set and just see if you can predict it accurately. And if your accuracy doesn't drop by too much, you've taken a big step to being comfortable that your model generalizes and doesn't overfit. The last point that I want to impress is, is the idea of how you measure the quality of your model. Because um, before you do any evaluation of your uh, model you've built, you want to make sure you, you consider what the baseline success or failure rate of a really, really simple or a really random model uh, would do. So for example, if I flip a coin, I'm have a, I have around 50% chance of guessing correct if I guess heads every time. Now let's say I went away and built a model that looked at things like the strength of my thumb, the diameter of the, of the, of the coin, humidity, wind speed, all those kind of things, and I got a 45% success rate. That could sound really exciting and really cool until you remember that guessing heads every time is literally better. Um, and that's something that I, like, people often tend to forget, that you want to compare against this really simple or really random model. So the steps to take uh, after this, I hope, is, is more to, like, to get, get hand, hands dirty and to dive in and have a poke around, because that's the fastest way to, to learn. That's how I managed, that's how I did it. Um, there are data sets and challenges all over the internet specifically for this, and even competitive ones, if that's, if that's your, your game, if you want to earn some money from it. Um, a really amazing community for that is Kaggle, um, and that's what I really recommend starting out with. I got started there with the two models they host specifically for people new to the field, the Titanic dataset, which I've referenced a few times already, and the Iowa housing dataset, which is their regression uh, example, where you're trying to predict the selling price of some houses in Iowa based off things like the floor space, number of bathrooms, have they got a swimming pool, etc. The way it sort of works is you go to the website, you download some data sets, they split it into a train test for you. You build a model on the train set, you point at a test set and get some predictions and upload it back to Kaggle, and then they'll score you and put you on a leaderboard. There are some really useful tutorials for getting started as well. I use this guy's Trevor Stevens, um, to help give you pointers on where to look. Um, I actually recommend looking at the machine learning exposed workshop that's happening later on this afternoon. So to actually get started, it's worth pointing out that you don't actually have to understand the nitty gritty, the inside out, or even much of the basics of how these models work in the same way that you don't really have to know how TCP works properly or at all to build a RESTful API. Um, there are implementations of the algorithms across almost every language. Um, skipping out all the imports and stuff. R, which is one of the most widely used data science languages, has it built in, it's native. You just call the R part function, which builds you a tree based off your data. Python has the really cool scikit-learn library, which is the go-to library for all data science and machine learning. And again, you just, you just initialize that classifier and then pass your data in. I personally haven't done any machine learning work in Java, but I know that Weka and MLlib are widely well seen in this space. And again, it's a case of running the imports, initializing your, your model and passing in, passing in the, the variables you care about. I would really recommend, though, getting started with R and Python, despite this being a Java conference, specifically because that's the most widely used la languages in industry. And there'll be loads and loads of resources out there to help with getting started. And then maybe once you get comfortable, you can move over to these uh, Java libraries. Now, after doing this, if it, takes your, if it takes your fancy and you find it really interesting, then it's worth having a dive under the hood and looking uh, at how the algorithms work. And for that, uh, I took the machine learning course by Andrew Ung. Um, it's on Coursera via Stanford University. And what it does is it uses MATLAB to show you the maths behind the magic of the algorithms. And it's quite eye-opening because it shows you some of the subtleties of how it works. I wouldn't let MATLAB put you off. Um, the fact that they use MATLAB lets you really understand specifically how the algorithm works. So that was 15 minutes, uh, a quick whirlwind tour. I hope that I've helped give a top-level overview of, some of machine learning and how you might approach it. Um, I really hope that I've made the first steps less dense and less inaccessible. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there's... Oh, I've got 20 seconds, so no. Thanks.